Well, uh, you can go ahead and kick off the recording then, Ryan. It's recording. All right, you want to kick things off, Andy? Yeah, so I'm Andrea Gunderson. Um, I am going to welcome you all to the Hyperledger yeah, Hyper TSC meeting today. Um, all are welcome here. Please abide by the antitrust policies and our community code of conduct. Thanks, Andy. And uh, if you haven't met Andy, she's been around for quite some time at Hyperledger. You may have met her at one of the Hackfests. Uh, she's one of the more prolific coders at Hyperledger with about 40,000 lines of code or so in uh, Sawtooth Core plus uh, SDK work. And I think our most prominent contributor on the WebAssembly engine, Saber. Yep. Uh, so I've invited uh, Andy to kick things off for us, uh, just like we had uh, Rodrigo Lima Verde Leal uh, a couple weeks ago to uh, bring the perspective from um, uh, from uh, Palo Verde. Uh, so Andy, I don't know if there's anything from from your experience at, at Hyperledger that that uh, you'd like to share with the TSC. Maybe things that they might not be aware of, or uh, maybe they are aware of, uh, but you wanna highlight anything that maybe makes it easier or more difficult to contribute here? Yeah, the only thing I'd like to um, mention is the, sometimes with how much volume there is on the mailing list, um, it'd be great if we could have like a central location for uh, decisions made, just so that they're easier to search through. Um, and find what the TSC decisions are. But besides that, I don't have anything else. Okay, that's a really good idea. So when, when the TSC makes decisions, if there's some centralized catalog somewhere of, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe RFC-like is, is maybe what's in your head? Yeah, obviously I'm really familiar with RFCs because we do that for Sawtooth, Grid, and Transact, but something similar to that, just a central location that you can see like a full, not, Super formal, but formal right up. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. That's something that we should think about. Uh, some sort of consolidated version of minutes that just addresses the decisions made and the, the proposals offered. Okay, great. Well, thanks, uh, and uh, uh, everybody, feel free to reach out with with one another, uh, regardless of, of these kinds of intros. It's good to be connected across our, our community here. Uh, we don't have any announcements this week, uh, but I thought we'd start off with a little bit of housekeeping. We've got three important task forces in flight, and one of the objectives of setting these things out as task forces was that they could operate more quickly than uh, a working group or in a, maybe a more uh, concerted way than, than having maybe just weekly discussions here in the TSC. Uh, so I wanted to check in and see how things were going, uh, starting first with the CICD work. I'm um, looking for that, uh, looking for some some sign on the horizon that that is winding up. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. So yeah, this is Dave Hughesby. Um, the CICD uh, task force has been chewing on this problem for a better part of two months. And the last meeting we had, which was a couple weeks ago, um, was lightly attended due to all of the travel in the summer, but we've been doing our best to drive towards a conclusion. Um, I have not produced a report due to that light, that try the, the travel and the lack of um, buy-in by all players. But if you've been watching the notes, you can kind of see where we're headed and I can give you some of the highlights here. We have narrowed down um, the proposal to a few options for short term and a few options for long term. Um, the only thing that's really important to note right now is that there is no like silver bullet. After considering a lot of things, there is no one solution that is going to be easy for everybody. Um, there's going to be some level of cost, um, whether it's an effort or yeah, it's basically cost and effort for people for all the teams to try to unify. And we're not even sure that's what we're going to do. So that said, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to provide an official report at this minute because 
um, we don't have buy-in by all of the teams and all the participants in the um, task force at the moment. But people are starting to come back online, and we're hoping to narrow that down and get everybody um, on board. And at that point, we will float something to the TSC. But it's just the the, the conclusions are not, or the sorry, the the proposals are soon to be <laughs> uh, sent to the TSC. I, I don't know exactly what soon is, but it's not a month from now. It's not tomorrow either. So somewhere in between. Okay. Great. I think the uh, probably the hard stop that we have is the um, the board meeting at the first of August. So um, uh, yep, I'm fully aware of that. I think we will have. Uh, I can tell you we will have a, a proposal before then, and we'll give the TSC enough time to consider it. Um, and it's important that it goes that it's done before the board because um, no matter what we do, I, I believe this will incur more financial cost to Hyperledger. So it'll take a bigger chunk out of the budget and we'll need to consider that. Okay, great. Um, so Arno is not here. I When I last checked in on the, the life cycle, um, the life cycle wiki page, uh, I didn't see any updates since I think the the twentieth of June. Uh, one of the last things that we had discussed was breaking out the uh, the issues or proposals into separate pages so that the the uh, comments could be more easily tracked for those. Uh, so maybe we'll look to follow up with Arno on that separately later. Uh, and then uh, the working groups, uh, I know that that was intending to trail behind the life cycle discussion to uh, incorporate any dependencies that come out of that. I don't know if there's been any discussion in that committee yet. Uh, nothing. I mean, it's basically, we've been capturing a bunch of notes, or I've been capturing a bunch of notes on the wiki page um, from various discussions. But as you said, it's really um, gated by the life cycle work. Okay, so I don't think we've got a hard stop that can help drive progress there, but um, clearly the like the update that we'll be looking at from the architecture working group later today and some of the other uh, working group updates, uh, as those have progress or, or difficulty making progress, the, the more that we can provide some improved direction about how working groups operate, the, you know, the better that'll be for, for all of those. And speaking of working groups, uh, move into our proposal for today, which is a proposal for a diversity, civility, and inclusion working group. Uh, I'll let you navigate on your own screens to the proposal itself, which is linked in the minutes. This work started uh, sometime in fall of last year, where we were looking more broadly at community health. And when the, the topic arose for, for it to be a working group, some of the feedback at that time was that that was too broad. Uh, and so the people that were interested in, in forming that working group at the time have continued to meet since that point and worked on, on honing into a more addressable scope. In parallel with that, the Linux Foundation has been uh, also focusing on its diversity, civility, and inclusion efforts. And so we've had uh, a few discussions with the Linux Foundation proper. It's been collaborating with us. Uh, and then also, again, narrowing down what we wanted to do across the, the possible things that we could do to, to improve community health to focus first on DCI. Um, Within that DCI scope, uh, we had a lot of discussions about, you know, what could we, what could we do, what could we do first, and some of uh, some of that decision making, you you would want to be informed by numbers to say, all right, where are we not uh, diverse, civil, or inclusive, um, and we don't have a lot of data to direct where we would prioritize our efforts first. Uh, I'm happy to say that we don't have at this time a lot of uh, civility issues. There's not been, uh, to my knowledge, any 
but for perhaps one report across the longevity of Hyperledger, uh, any civility issues. So then it, it really comes down to how, what can we do to improve inclusion and, and our diversity. And, and being able to measure those is, is one of the first things that we want to go after. We found that as a group, it was difficult to get the kind of engagement that we were looking for from, from other parts of Hyperledger and to uh, figure out how we would resource or, or capture some of these metrics in the in the way that we were we were able to interact. Uh, so limitations of not having things simple things like a, a mailing list and, and the visibility that comes from a working group were, were really impairing our ability to move forward. So uh, as we've as we've gotten more concrete on the steps that we've liked to take, and we've we've also become more aware of the limitations that we were operating under. Uh, we put together this proposal, and uh, we've circulated this with uh, not just the the TSC list, but before that, uh, as we look to to build support for it, it's been socialized with the governing board and with the uh, maintainers mail lists. And so I'm I'm hoping that uh, even though this is the first meeting that that we're discussing the the proposal itself, that it's something that's not necessarily news to the the majority of, of people on the call. Uh, as we skim down in in the in the proposal itself, we've got a, a pretty healthy list of interested parties that have been working together uh, over different periods of time on this, with with a couple of newer additions as as we've started to bring this proposal forward. Uh, but that that list doesn't even quite capture the full list of contributors. One of the principles that that we like to act on in Hyperledger is making sure that the initiatives that we undertake are community driven, uh, and we have a lot of strong staff support for a number of the uh, for a number of these initiatives that we do at Hyperledger. But in this one in particular, I have to say that that I feel like there's really strong staff support um, just based on on the motivations of uh, of the the staff participating that this is an area that the people feel pretty passionate about and good about contributing to so that list of interested parties really doesn't capture um, the the full set of participation that we have there what we'd like to do is uh, get started with the working group, get those tools that we don't have available to us right now, like the mail list and so forth, and get underway for some period of uh, two or three months uh, with me helping to guide that initial period. But I know we've got a lot of strong leaders already on that list, and we'll be looking during that initial phase for uh, one or more of them to step up and then uh, select amongst ourselves for a more permanent lead for the group. Uh, there's there's quite a few references there if if you have time to go through them of, of materials that's been gathered over the several months that we've been working more or less behind the scenes there and and that also helps support our ability to uh, execute successfully once this is launched as a working group and so uh, with that I'd like to invite any questions uh, or any comments from the the other um, the other Participants that have been uh, working together on the on the proposal. Yeah, Dan, Mark. Um, one of the things I've brought up on some of the calls, the um, committee calls in the past, is what are we going to do with the data? We don't have clear goals. You know, if the data shows that you know we don't know what the industry averages are, is the goal to just increase participation? Then are we just baselining and Seeing that we improve gender diversity, I mean, I'm I'm all for improving gender diversity, but if you know the data shows we're fifty percent ahead of the industry average, you know, what do we do with that? What it seems like we're collecting data to collect data. Yeah, de definitely not collecting data to collect data. Uh, we want to use data as a means of direction for us, and and like you say, if it turns out that that our participation is actually ahead of industry benchmarks, then that would um, that would tell us to focus on some area where we're weaker. 
some of the materials that that uh, I think Mandy helped assemble did have some benchmarking in it. Um, I don't know if it's sufficient benchmarking uh, at the industry level or not, but what we don't have is any any sort of benchmarking for for Hyperledger itself. You, uh, Mark, you touched on something that um, I, I'm, I'm allergic to collecting metrics, you know, just to collect metrics, um, as you said. Uh, and my, my question about any metric that is proposed is if we had had this metric a year or two ago, whatever the number, how would that have informed our actions? How would we have acted differently if we had this metric some time ago? Um, so that's what I usually try to uh, think about any metric that we're proposing to collect. Um, if we if it wouldn't produce something actionable, then don't don't collect it. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So 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 then, what's the answer to your question? And how would what would we have done differently if we'd had this information earlier? So I I think what we were balancing was. Uh, an interest in moving forward in a data-driven way uh, with an inability to actually have that data. And so we've, we've taken some stabs at, at some ways that we can take some actions, but also wanting to fulfill that, uh, that interest in having some data-based decision-making. And one of the actions that we would, uh, that we would make differently or, or the same would be actually understanding if, if we do have uh, a discrepancy in, in the representation that we have at Hyperledger versus industry benchmarks. So more specifically uh, with, with the, the gender issue, for example, we, we, we picked that for the reasons that are stated in the proposal, uh, which amounts in some ways to saying that that's the small amount of signal that we have to work with. But if we had uh, a stronger signal saying that that gender was not uh, a strong issue for Hyperledger, but we had some other inclusion problem, uh, then that would help us spend more time on the problem that we did have. So Dan, how do you, um how do you see this working group reporting back to the TSC? Is this going to follow the, the normal working group pattern, which is driving towards some white paper or some, you know, technical article, or do you see them being more active in the TSC? Like, um, you know, doing monthly updates to the TSC mailing list or something like that, almost like a, a DNI newsletter or something. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's likely to be uh, more varied and more contained kinds of deliverables than having a like a long term white paper. Uh, the intent would definitely be to bring back recommendations as we're we're able to, and then also act in in other venues like when we're having an event, for example, making sure that 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 event is is executed in a way that, that helps support the DCI initiatives. So not just maybe written reports, uh, but, but those kind of actions as well as, as the feedback to the, the groups listed there. Great, thank you. So I think there was a comment on this um, at one point on the page. Um, why is this part of the TSC rather than the marketing committee? We had um, some very specific deliverables listed there that were about uh, engagement plans uh, and that related to some actions that the that Hyperledger staff was taking. And so the wording of those sounded a little bit marketing oriented. And what we did to uh, help clarify that that you'll still be able to see in the 
the history for the page is is that we moved that off of there's three work products listed there we there was originally two listed uh, and so what we did was we added the line for recommendations to Hyperledger staff which those items fell underneath uh, and then also just uh, moved those those very specific recommendations that were already in flight off of the proposal itself just because they were uh, they were a little bit narrower in time than what the, the proposal should encompass. But it, it could also be a good recommendation. I'm not sure if you're making it that, that, uh, uh, that this working group also provides feedback to the, the marketing committee. So I had a question about the difference between what we would consider a regular working group and some of the actions that this group is, is planning on taking. Um, for most of our regular working groups, the, the result is really more like a paper or you know, guidelines or just general um, guidance or things for the general community to just consume. It seems like this group has in mind more particularly to make policy recommendations and build tools that directly affect community structure. Um, and I'm, I wonder if maybe it would be better to classify it as something more than just a working group as a result. Um, maybe classify it as some sort of uh, committee or task force that reports to some element of Hyperledger's governance structure um, where they'll build a recommendation that then would be ratified. Um, because, you know, I like the idea that we're discovering what we need to do to affect how we um, manage the community and make that uh, more official um, output perhaps of this group. Yeah, there, there's a lot of different names that we could put any of these efforts underneath. And I think when this came up in the fall, it, since it felt different than other working groups, that was one piece of resistance that, that we met. Um, but some of the very tactical things that came out of our experience in the last several months was that uh, there, there was a, almost a, an irony to what we were facing that in trying to create a group about inclusivity, we were a fairly hidden group. Uh, there was no mail list. There wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of visibility into what we were doing. And that made it hard for us to, to have the kind of engagement that we need across the breadth of the community to really understand the community and incorporate uh, the kind of feedback that, that could be provided. So while I think that we could put a lot of different names on this effort, it's the, it's the recommendation of this group that a working group is the, the best choice that we have to give the right kind of tools to make this effort successful. I mean, to, to further Nathan's point, um, it almost seems like this should be something addressed by the governing board. It, from a technical steering point of view, I mean, it's increasing participation, but are we setting a technical direction for Hyperledger by doing this? I mean, would the governing board be able to give this more resources than the TSC can? Uh, that's another good thought. Uh, the governing board meets less frequently than um, they, they, uh, they've got a slower frequency of, of interaction and reaction than something like a working group would be able to facilitate. I think uh, as well, keeping this closely connected to the development communities uh, and looking at how the development, how the, you know, the teams work, right, is pretty important. Um, certainly the governing board will pay attention uh, to whatever gets produced out of this, I, I would imagine. But, um, you know, I, I don't think you all would want, you know, as the governing board said, we've decided thou shalt, you know, change how, how you all work. Um, you know, you, you'd, you'd want some say in that. Right, you'd want, you want, uh, and, I, and I think the more public this conversation, um, usually the better, right? So uh, don't, it's not like the governing board would be ignoring this. Um, I think it's just best to have it rooted very closely to where the development activity is, or consider that at least. I mean, I think it's a, it's, 
a technical failure to, to, you know, in a similar way that it's financial failure to have a smaller percentage of women on boards. Um, so I, I like the idea of having it in the technical steering committee. One thing I, I'm struggling, and maybe this is putting the cup before the horses a bit because the group hasn't started, but um, I'm, given that these are cultural and systemic things, what does anyone have a nice example of an action or a recommendation that might flow from this, or maybe already has in, in previous work that people have actually done and that helped? Yeah, um, so we've got, We've got some expertise on the on the group here. Uh, Mandy, for example, this is uh, the this is her uh, PhD background. So I, I know she's got a number of examples. I know she's not able to join us today. Uh, Tracy, I might be able to put on the spot, or I might not. But uh, I know that she related in in the last meeting that we had um, a very specific example. So I'll, I'll let. Tracy, speak up if she wants to now. Otherwise, I'll just uh, uh, yammer a little bit. Yeah, so I guess my example was my first contribution to Hyperledger and Fabric. Uh, I was trying to make a documentation change, and um, it was a one line change, and, and it was actually rejected um because it wasn't large enough in scope right i was trying to keep my my chains down to a very narrow scope and uh, get something in that was basically a a typo sort of fix right um and you know i think that would have been extremely disheartening for anybody coming in who uh, didn't you know kind of want to get this change in right to say okay well you know, they don't want my simple change. I'm just going to leave this community. Um, and it really helped me specifically because I had uh, Nick Gasky, who was basically being a mentor for me to make that contribution, right? It was the first time I was ever contributing to Fabric. Didn't really know the process of contributing to, to Garrett and, and what that process looks like. And he basically helped me through that process, helped me understand why the change was rejected um and, and i think we don't do enough of that in inside of hyperledger in the community uh you know the, at least i haven't seen enough of that is is the mentoring uh the responding back to people uh the the answering questions or or just helping somebody through the process of, of contributing and it's not to say it doesn't exist but i, I think it needs to to be more right i think we need to make sure that we're a community that is welcoming to all um, and and make sure that the uh, the people who do want to contribute and, and have taken some time to uh, of their you know lives to, to put together a pr are in some way recognized and and um you know helped through the process to understand why or, or how uh, to get something into into the Hyperledger project. So I guess that was my example, right, Dan? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, That's great. Quick, yeah. And, and <laughs> Karsten on, on chat was, was also um, uh, sort of emphasizing that in, in a similar way as well. Another example that comes to mind that, that Mark Wagner shared, uh, and I'll let Mark speak up for himself here, related to how, how people interact in, in the sort of social work settings that, that we have and, and is still relevant in Hyperledger when we have things like member summits and uh, hack fests and, and so forth. So Mark, I don't know if you, if you recall what, what I'm referring to as far as like going out to, to get a drink and that kind of thing. I think Mark dropped off the call. I, yeah, I guess he is not here, but uh, so one of the anecdotes that, that he related to, to us was about becoming aware that um, there can be a big gender bias in, in going out and hitting a bar or something, which is considered a, a social thing for a lot of people, but uh, other people aren't comfortable with, and, and that can be not just a, a gender issue, but uh, an issue for people that, that don't want to um, participate for other reasons. And in a venue like a like a bar um, 
there's there's been a, a number of of other anecdotes shared in in these meetings and the, that I think are actionable things that that we can bring forward uh, and create some general awareness. Maybe the the last one that that I'll hit on is uh, being made aware of uh, accessibility concerns for using software. So not just how are we forming as a community, but but also this this sort of uh, feedback loop that you get in what kind of software you create is what kind of community that you're building in front ends for our software are the things that the people who are visually impaired uh, can still make use of. There's a lot of different considerations that that we might look at beyond gender, which is kind of focused a little bit in this uh, in this proposal, but things that are that are actionable in very different ways across Hyperledger. So could you just give me an idea of what policies might look like and in particular, given that this is an open source project, how you would hold people accountable for those? Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to explain a solution that the, the goal of the proposal is to arrive at some solutions. So I, I can't tell you the end state right now, but what, what we can point to are um, some of the, the, the anecdotes that I just related, being able to provide those as is ways to sensitize people to things that they might not be aware of. So those aren't necessarily things that require enforcement as much as they require awareness. And there is a degree of enforcement that comes from our, um, uh, our uh, community code of conduct. So there is, there's an explicit enforcement in that. Uh, so any sort of violations of that, there's actually a, a policy around there. Uh, I think a more, one of the most effective ways to, to bring about some of that change, though, is, is not reacting to violations of policies uh, as much as it is doing the more positive and proactive thing like we've done in, in adding the All Are Welcome Here banner to a lot of the materials that we produce. So setting the tone out front that this is a, a welcoming organization uh, as opposed to uh, a more punitive tone that uh, if you're here you better behave so <clears throat> my I, it, as you are deeply aware um, and I think all of our companies have um, very specific policies for for hiring for um, uh, for how interactions work, for what our expectations for the environment and the, uh, that we're creating, um, and within those companies, there's you know that, that we have our HR organizations that can enforce some of those policies. Um, I mean, just to throw something out for discussion purposes only, you know, would be we would we be willing to do something like say um, the TSC uh, vote um, would not be um, or we could not vote on TSC members until at least one third of the candidates were diverse. Um, I mean, would we <clears throat> would we be willing to accept policies like that to force us to um, solicit participation more broadly? And, and, and I guess what I'm saying is a lot of what I hear right now is still very passive. Like, let's let's make sure we don't step on somebody's toes, as opposed to being very active in um, and forcing ourselves to be active in soliciting broader participation. Um, and, and I'm just throwing that out there solely for the purpose of, of driving discussion, but will we go to that extreme? So I've got some thoughts about that, but I've been, um, I've been fielding a lot of the questions, so I, I do wanna make sure that I, I give opportunity here for further people to react.
I guess maybe well, well, people are are considering a question that they'd never considered before. I I can say that, um, uh, we've considered policies like that, uh, or or policies like that are under consideration at the board level, and so I think from from my perspective as one voice on the TSC. That's certainly that's certainly a a degree or a kind of something that's that would warrant consideration. Uh, I don't know that we want to get caught up in in specifics uh, of numbers or, or the policy itself, but that that as Mick you say something more proactive than passive is certainly something that should be on the table for consideration. I think that's a it's a classic issue um, whereby do you want to be someone who came into a body because you were on a list? A lot of people who would be on a list that I know uh, would say no to that. The other thing is in formulating your definition of what is diverse candidate, you are inadvertently discriminatory. So there's a lot of um, book guns there, um, to use a Hughesby term. Um, if the passive way works, um, then maybe that's better because of that. But if it's too slow, perhaps not. Yeah, th these are all sensitive issues and, and you can definitely, with good intentions, create a more negative result. But one of the things that I'm appreciating out of this conversation is that there is strong interest amongst the TSC um, and interest to go after some of these uncomfortable questions. And I hope that we can see participation from, from as many of the, the TSC members as possible in the, the first meetings of this working group, assuming that we, we get to a point where we're comfortable voting on that. Um, I guess I will say, just position-wise, um, this is an issue that has to be addressed, and I'm all in favor of addressing the issue. I'm just not sure i understand why this is a tsc versus um a uh, governing board issue that's that's my only uh, it feels like we're trying to establish much broader policy than just technical policy um and that moves it out of the realm of exclusively the technical steering committee doesn't mean we shouldn't be represented we should be represented and we should be held accountable for it uh, but it feels like a broader issue than just what we're doing I would agree with that sentiment in that um, it seems like this policy would directly benefit a lot of the other efforts that go on outside the technical effort as well. Um, I really like the idea that we would play a strong role and a big part of you know, what constitutes this working group, but it certainly seems like more than just a technical working group. Yeah, can we actually get some experts? I think, Dan, you mentioned Mandy uh, to, to provide some recommendations on this. Like having a, you know, having a program like this designed only by engineers seems like a disaster waiting to happen. Right, right. We, you wouldn't want people who are outside of the discipline trying to forge their way blind through that. And that's that's not the intent of this group. We, we do have some expertise on, and we also have to recognize that as an open source community, there's no there's nobody closer to impacting that community than the contributors within it. And so there's definitely roles to be played up at the governing board level. There's roles to be played at the Linux Foundation. But I would think that abdicating our responsibility for some sense that there is a more powerful entity that could do more would be a, uh, a fairly weak mistake. I'm not claiming that we should do that. I'm just saying that we should get, you know, diversity experts to 
to help us come up with something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my, my answer there wasn't directed specifically at, at your question, but there was there was a few comments in there about uh, from from you and others about the level of engagement from the board and, and sort of a existential question about whether or not as a uh, a working group within the uh, community that we have, whether we ought to do this. So I, I'd like to point out that we do also, we have the ability to go to a wider scope as well. Um, there's chaos, which is, uh, you know, a project underneath the Linux foundation. They have quite a bit of representation from Mozilla and the chaos DNI group, uh, has experts on it and they, they do this stuff. So if, you know, we could work closely with chaos, uh, DCI group, um, we could probably, you know, leverage their expertise and work more broadly, you know, across open source at all. And I see Mark's hands up. So, Yeah. So sorry, I had to drop for a minute. I'm back. Um, so one thing, I mean, even before um, we go forward with a working group and all, if we have like the member summit coming up, is there something we want to do there? Or is it too late to try to plan to have a little table set up or a booth or something and, and try to start spreading the message that we want to improve diversity? And, you know, rather than focus long term, what can we do short term as well? Um, who was it that? Uh... I forget. I, I think we had this discussed at at one of the meetings, and I can't recall what the outcome of that was. Whether there was room in the schedule or, or whether the schedule was already uh, full, um, but it would seem that that some sort of booth space or or signage or something would be addressable, even if even if schedule time wasn't. I think maybe. Karen, I want to say, was was looking at that, and I don't see her on the call today. Yeah, she's on PTO. Okay. Okay. Um, so sort of cycling back to the, the beginning of things to help wind this uh, conversation up for today is uh, at that time, there was feedback that things were too broad. We brought a narrower scope that is more addressable today. And I'm hearing a mixture of feedback about uh, maybe it's not so much breadth as uh, um, the uh yeah i guess i'm not sure what what word to select there but but actually pushing a little bit in, in the direction of of more impact uh so um i w my preference is is to keep the proposal worded more or less in the the scope that it is we it's always easy to broaden scope uh but i think that what we found is that in in other working groups is that with the you're more likely to have success the the more targeted that you make your effort there are any other uh, concluding thoughts from from tsc members yeah i think a working group is probably the best point you know, the best way to go forward with this. Um, you know, I'm just trying to make sure we've explored all the options as a TSC, but, um, you know, but it, it gets treated as a working group. So that would help, I think. And it can work with other groups and projects. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I, I think that's an important point is that we don't have to leave this, we don't have to have in this proposal the ultimate solution to 
all the problems and and the ultimate way that we can act on those but if members feel that the proposal hits uh within enough specificity that that we can be successful a lot of these questions can be explored within the context of of the working group itself i'll point out that we have uh 10 minutes left and we are we going to cover the contributor summit if we're, if we're going to take a vote i propose we do it soon Yeah, um, so I'm not clear from the feedback that we've gotten if, if we're at a stage that, that somebody is interested in making a motion. Um, so I think that maybe what we'll do is, is let people consider this proposal for the next week and provide any other feedback and then we can, we can pick it up again with, with less discussion next week. All right, um, we've got a, a couple of quarterly reports that, that I wanna just touch on real quick before we go into the Contributor Summit discussion, which we might not have full time for. Um, so I, I saw that most people were able to take a look at both of those updates. Um, I think that we have contributors from both of those teams on the call right now. Uh, so if there's any verbal questions that, uh, let's go in order here. So for the, the architecture working group update, um, I don't want to walk through the update itself, but if there's any verbal questions that, that people want to, to bring up now, uh, this is probably the best time to do it. I think there was um, a question raised in the report about what they do with Transact. And so I don't know if that's something people want to discuss or not. I think that was a, a cogent point that was brought up. Um, and so I, I can uh, try to make sure that people are connected there. Okay, not hearing further questions and being short on time, I'll move up to the uh, Sawtooth update. Uh, do we have any verbal questions there? And I noticed there was one comment that I had responded to earlier uh, today on, on the report itself. Okay, great. So I think we got through both of those reports in under 120 seconds, which gives us time for the contributor summit. Um, so, uh, we've, we've talked at different times over the course of the year about how do we get together for a face to face. Um, we haven't been doing the hack fests that we had, uh, been doing in the past. Uh, we, we'd spoken earlier about splitting out the, the different objectives that we had had for these face to faces into something that's more recruitment driven and then something that's closer to doing core development. And so we've addressed the former with, with a couple of boot camps so far this year, but we really haven't gotten together um, with, with groups of maintainers and core contributors to, to do some hands-on work that uh, can be done in a way that doesn't also get distracted by trying to um, create pitches and, and, and things like that for, for new contributors. Uh, I reached out to my company to ask for space. Uh, this is one of the things that w is always a challenge in putting the events together is, is what can we do from a budgetary perspective and, and what can we do for, for venues. So uh, Intel is willing to donate space so that we can sit face to face. Uh, I specifically asked for an area where we could work collaboratively but, but would not really lend itself to people putting up PowerPoint and um, making long presentations, uh, but we can, we can certainly talk about the, the nature of the work that we do there. Hey, hey Dan, this is Mike Klein. Um, Accenture can probably offer space as well, and, and we have offices in most locations, so that, 
that should open up wherever you, you would like to do that. That's fantastic. Also, um, uh, Sovereign has located a space that can do the larger numbers in um, Salt Lake City that they're um, negotiating with right now to have it be free. It is one of those um, office spaces that we really like to have these kind of events in that's super open and has the tables and has the rooms and has all the complete breakouts. But the key element that we're working on right now is free. Yep. So I think any, um, with any space that, that we can put our hands on, um, when, when uh, staff asked whether I could find the space, that's some space that I found there in Hillsboro, Oregon. Um, so if, if there's other offers of free space that can come in in a similar timeline, I think we can pick whatever looks like the, the geographic centroid. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> Well, I will point out that we used to, you know, when this project started, right, we were going to do six of these a year, and then it was four, and then it was three. And if we have, you know, if, if we have a, a handful of spaces that we can use, there's no reason that we just use one of them, right? Right. So, you know, let a million uh, flowers bloom. And if we can have multiples, that means that it may be less onerous for people if they miss one. If we get back to a cadence where we're doing one of these every two or three months, um, missing one won't be so bad, right? Right. Yeah, so as far as timing, uh, we were looking at um, getting outside the, the summer vacation schedule for the Northern Hemisphere and uh, the back to school schedule. And uh, anyway, so sometime end of September, beginning of October was what was um, suggested in, in, in one discussion. So that's, that's the, the parameters there for, for one option that's in front of us. If people want to offer up additional options, that's that's great as well. Um, and uh, imagine that we might want to have some discussion on the composition of of the group at these. the The starting point for for this one was considering uh, getting the the maintainers and uh, significant contributors who are, for whatever reason, not not also maintainers together. Um, to do particularly a, a focus on uh, cross project development. Hey Dan, um, how would you see this? Uh, let me see, let me try to get my words together here. Right, um, there have also there's also been some discussion of having a boot camp in that time frame. Um, do you see this as great? Let's do both, or maybe not. I think not. Right. So. I yeah, that we have to resolve that conflict. And then there's also, um, I think September would be probably better than October because some of the events in October are things that we participated in, in the past, like ATO, like all things open and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, we're threading the needle on this one. It's not as easy as, as like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and we do tend to get into some spiraling discussions about optimality on calendars and there's no way to avoid all the uh, all the conflicts that people have, and it also tends to be difficult to book these spaces in um, uh, without some significant heads up. So, for example, getting this this space in Hillsboro, Oregon, that that uh, October th those October days were the the nearest days that I was able to get booking for. Well, yeah, I mean, the calendar might be the driving function on which one we pick. So, or which ones, you know, again. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah, you're right. So TSC members, maintainers, contributors, uh, any feedback on the, the, the goal of, of the Contributor Summit? So it's essentially a hackathon sort of rebranded, right? 
versus yeah, but, the summit we had last year in Switzerland. Can, can I, I don't, I, I don't think it's right to think of it either as comparable to like the Hackfest series that we had had before, nor a hackathon, nor um, just, you know, kind of an optional kind of thing. I think the idea was, you know, the group of maintainers and, and even the TSC members here meet face to face so irregularly um, that, you know, you don't really get a chance to build the kind of trust that's essential to make good open source projects work. And that there are a couple of really important themes like convergence that, you know, we can iterate over email uh, and, and approximate to, but sometimes getting all the, all the right people in the room to be able to kind of look each other in the eye and commit to something is something that just doesn't happen, you know, over, over email kind of asynchronously, right? So this, I would encourage people to think about a contributor summit as distinct from those uh, as being something where it's a little bit higher priority to make sure that all the, or like at least a critical mass of maintainers on a critical mass of projects like Ledger can make it. Um, and that it's, it feels less optional or less kind of unfocused uh, uh, or, or un unconferency as uh, say the Hackfest or, or have, and not really a competition the way many people think of hackathons. If that's something people want. If they don't want that, that's something that doesn't have to be imposed on them. But it felt like there was a need for that distinct from the other. I think there is a need for that, but that does stand in opposition to what Ree was suggesting about minimizing the badness of missing one. I guess we're trying to sell it as a sort of single event where that's, that's the one you put effort into. If you've got four a year and you can't go to four, then you choose one, so you split the crowd. That exactly. was my misunderstanding. I, I misunderstood, and I see we're at time. Yeah, so uh, please take the rest of the discussion then to the, the mail list and you can build on that, that particular thread uh, if you've got feedback on the objective or have alternate dates and venues to suggest. Uh, thanks for everybody's engagement today. Great.